Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, in Jesus' name we come to you tonight, and we praise you, Father. It's been a good day. It's been a beautiful day, and, uh, and Lord, we thank you. Uh, we do have prayers about our health, but Lord, we're here tonight. We thank you for that, that you've given us the health and the ability to be here tonight. Uh, we, we thank you for those who will be tuning in on YouTube, and we ask your blessing on them. Uh, Father, we ask you that you would continue to be with John and, uh, and with Larry and with all those in the congregation who are going through uh, some medical issues uh, today, uh, Marsha included, um, and I know there's more. We have folks who, uh, who are home ill tonight, and uh, we ask you that you would be with them. We also pray, Lord, for that, that uh, group that was meeting in Ohio. We ask you that they would be blessed you keep them safe and that uh, you would stir their spirit toward Christ. And uh, Father, tonight we are opening your word and uh, there's going to be several places we're looking. We ask you for wisdom. We ask you, Lord, to teach us and uh, that we can grow closer to you, know more about this place that you've gone to prepare for us. And uh, Father, we'll give you the glory in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Dave Marks called me yesterday. Said everything's going well over there. Oh, good, good. Uh, well, tonight, um, let me just give you uh, first of all the series verse. the The series that we're in is heaven and hell, not heaven or hell, but heaven and hell. We're going to take a look into both. Uh, hopefully, uh, uh, when we look into heaven, uh, with uh, the Lord Jesus being our uh, our constant companion in heaven, that that's going to be the place you want to be. And those who are tuning in on, on YouTube, uh, we, we want you to also uh, desire that. Uh, also, uh, we're going to look into what the Bible says about hell. And my hope with that is that if we take a good long look at that, that, uh, you know, the, the Bible says that the fear of the Lord is what? The of it's the beginning of wisdom. And so uh, should we be totally frightened of the Lord? I'm not saying that, but what I'm saying is a good healthy fear uh, is, uh, is a good thing. A good healthy respect and a fear and knowing who God is and awe. Uh, remember uh, Desert Storm? Uh, before Desert Storm, there was the shock and awe that uh, uh, I think that was President Bush, wasn't it? Uh, shock and awe. Well, the awe part is uh, you just stand in awe of this God who is so powerful. And, uh, and we, we want to have that healthy respect for him and uh, knowing who he is and knowing who we are and that we are not God. He is. Uh, the series verse is Romans 6.23, if somebody wants to read that for me. Nice and loud. Amen. Right there you have it. There is a there is a, a clear difference. The wages, the payday of sin is death. It's eternal death, eternal destruction. It is torment uh, forever and ever. It is solitude. It is without Christ. It is it is an awful thing. But even though the wages of sin is death, life is available through Jesus Christ our Lord. Eternal life comes from Jesus Christ. And so there is there are two places. There's not four places. There's not three places as much as, as uh, some people actually teach three places. There's not a third place. There is heaven and there is hell. We need to make a decision. We need to come to Jesus Christ. Uh, so let me introduce tonight before I give you the title of, of what we're doing uh, this way. Uh, for thousands of years, mankind has pondered the question what happens to you when you die? What happens to me when I die? What happens uh, in the grave or after the grave? Our souls crave an answer to that, don't they? Uh, I mentioned last week what, the things I used to think when I was a, a little boy. Uh, I'm sure we've all had those kind of thoughts. You, every person has to eventually come and face that, that, that uh, they are not eternal, that, that there is a time when we will meet the grave if Christ hasn't come first. And, uh, and uh, since we uh, know that each of us must walk through that door from time to eternity, 
Many fear death and the moment uh, when something has to happen to your soul, something has to happen. Now for some, they think that when they die, it's lights out, that's it, it's over, game done, and, uh, and there's nothing. You just go into nothingness. Um, and uh, for, for those of us who believe in God's word, we know that that's not right. We know that there is an eternity. And I'm, I, I just tell you, I, I don't think you can even imagine the, the you that's inside of you ever being shut off forever. I just don't think that because God has put in us the knowledge that our souls are eternal. Uh, Woody Allen once said, I'm not really fond of quoting Woody Allen, but this is a good quote. Woody Allen once said, I'm not afraid of death. I just don't want to be there when it happens. <laughs> I thought that was good. And as I searched for quotes as, as uh, an introduction tonight, I ran across a quote from a preacher. Maybe you've heard of him, Jeff Strite. <laughs> it, was a, it was a quote on the internet from 2015. Jeff said, when I was five, my grandfather died. As I stood by the graveside at the cemetery, my mother said, I looked down into the grave and then turned to her and asked, How's Grandpa ever going to get out of there? <laughs> I know that Jeff knows the answer now. <laughs> uh, the wonderful truth is that God hasn't hidden the answers to these questions. Yeah, we don't understand every part of the mechanics. That's a God thing. But God has given us plenty of answers to this question. Uh, so as we look to God's word for answers, we're going to find a glimpse into eternity, into heaven and into hell. Uh, God gives us a glance into both and, uh, and a good look into both. Um, many of heaven's magnificent details uh, are written in the pages of Scripture. What heaven will look like, how your soul's going to get there, um, our reuniting with our saved loved ones in heaven, uh, and uh, a peek at your eternal resurrected body. Uh, we get, we get a, a little peek at that eternity. Uh, for those who are saved, promises to be a life forever beyond whatever we can dream. Whatever we can dream. And our fear of death fades away the more we know about this God and our Savior Jesus Christ. Amen? Amen. Amen. So tonight's topic is this. Won't heaven be boring? No. <laughs> now you say that. But do you know why you say that? Uh, so I'm going to go through some reasons, and uh, I believe I've got four reasons, four categories, and, and there are many more, but these are four good categories, I think, to tell you about that, that's going to tell you that heaven is anything but boring. Uh, so many today say that they don't believe in a heaven, a hell, or a God. And, uh, and heaven is uh, lightheartedly depicted on television and by comedians. And, uh, and uh, uh, you'll see, uh, hear jokes. Uh, you, you know you've heard the jokes about St. Peter at the gate of heaven. And uh, I looked for a clean joke about that. I couldn't find one. So I uh, didn't use it. Uh, but uh, you can just imagine St. Peter uh, at, the, at the gates, the pearly gates, uh, checking IDs on the way in. Uh, something like that, like he's a bouncer. Heaven is the topic of jokes and comedy sketches. Uh, and, um, and for many, heaven seems to be boring. They say they want to be where their friends are, and that's in hell. And uh, because they're, they're talking about drinking parties, and that's where the girls are going to be, and that's where drugs and, and sex and, and, uh, and raisin cane, that's, all that stuff is, is uh, where they want to be. But, but, uh, but listen, there's no drinking, there's no drugs, there's no sex, there's no fun in hell. There's none. Uh, we're going to save that discussion for later. I'll, I'll take your question here in just a minute, but we'll save that discussion because tonight we're talking about heaven. Uh, but I can assure you that you won't be hanging out with your drinking buddies in hell. Yes. I should have a question. It's a smart answer. Okay. Statement. If there was a drink in hell, in hell it would be a hot toddy. Okay. <laughs> uh, okay. Uh, that's a good one, yeah. Uh, I gave you, a, I think in the very first lesson, I gave you an epitaph that, uh, that was on a tombstone. Let me give you another one. 
Uh, in fact, I might have a couple tonight. I don't know. Uh, there's a this, there's a uh, there's an epitaph on a tombstone that goes like this: Here lies a poor woman who always was tired, for she lived in a place where help wasn't hired. Her last words on earth were, "Dear friends, I'm going where washing ain't done and sweeping nor sewing, and everything there is exact to my wishes. For where they don't eat, there's no washing of dishes." Don't weep for me now, don't weep for me ever. I'm going to do nothing forever and ever. <laughs> Doesn't that sound boring? Oh my goodness. <laughs> and uh, if you don't know your Bible, maybe you think that that's what heaven's going to be. It's just a place where you do nothing forever and ever. Uh, nothing forever? You know, that's boring. That just sounds awful. Um, there was a time in my life when I knew I wanted to be with God. I knew I wanted to be in heaven. But I wondered, what in the world are we going to be doing there? Uh, Eating a culvers. <laughs> yeah. Our children cry sometimes. If you have kids, you know there's been times where your kids say, I'm bored. I'm bored. And many never recover from that. They grow up to be adults that say, I'm bored. they got to have something going on all the time. Do you know people like that? <laughs> Always looking for entertainment, amusement, and something exciting to see or hear or do. So bored people sometimes aren't interested in a place that they don't know about, a place in the clouds, a place where they believe there's angels sitting on clouds strumming their hearts, and, and you're just going to sit around all day in a massive church worship session uh, throughout eternity. They just are, they, you know, they don't spend any time in church, and that's for a reason. They don't want to. So they're, they're thinking, why do I want to be in a place like that? I am going to be what? Bored. Okay, he gets it. Come on, Larry. <laughs> in fact, there are many Christians that believe that heaven will be boring. Can you believe that? But it's better than hell, they think. So that's where they choose to go. Uh, let me give you four biblical reasons why heaven will not be boring at all. Uh, and, and I'm drawing these again. I said this in the first lesson. I'm drawing these from a series uh, that was given and uh, a series that we used in Titusville in Pennsylvania uh, called um, uh, Revealing the Mysteries of Heaven. Uh, God, uh, in, in the first, uh, first of the four, heaven will not be boring because, oh, well, you got your pens ready, right? Heaven will not be boring because God is not boring. Let's turn to Psalm 16. Psalm 16. Some of these points have more, more scripture passages than other, but, but uh, here we're going to begin in Psalm 16. When you get to Psalm 16, say amen. Amen. All right, let's have somebody read Psalm 16, verse 11, nice and loud. You will show me the path of life. In your presence is fullness of joy. At your right hand are pleasures forevermore. Okay. Uh, fullness of joy, pleasures forevermore. Does that sound boring? <laughs> At your, in your presence, there is fullness of joy. Full, you, know, you know what fullness is. It's the opposite of emptiness. Fullness of joy and at your right hand, in other words, in your presence also, are pleasures forevermore. If, if God's word says there are pleasures for us forevermore in his presence, at his right hand, you can believe it. Why? Because God made us. God created us. He knows what makes us tick. He knows what's pleasurable. He knows what, what uh, his people uh, what his family are going to enjoy. And so uh, Psalm 1611 says there is fullness of joy and pleasures forevermore in his presence. Let's look at Luke chapter 12. Luke chapter 12. You get everybody there. And if somebody would read verse 32 for me, these are the words of Jesus, verse 32. Do not be afraid, little flock, for your father has been pleased to give you the kingdom. 
Amen. Uh, the New King James says, fear not, little flock. I like that too. I like that too, both, both ways. Uh, for it's your father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. God wants to please his family. It's like any father. You know what? Um, I can't tell you the times when we've celebrated the birth of Christ at Christmas where Marsha and I have basically spent our whole budget on our kids uh, blessing them with the things that we know would please them and, uh, and letting them know that it's because uh, we're celebrating the birth of our Savior and, and the joy that came from him coming to earth and dying for our, our sins and rising so that we could live also. And uh, so, hey, heaven is God's place and God is not boring. Maybe, maybe people get that idea that God is boring from guys like me, you know, preachers and teachers and elders and stuffy people uh, that, that uh, you know, some, sometimes we can be boring. Are y'all listening? Are you awake? Yeah. <laughs> so, sometimes a preacher can be boring, amen? And so uh, maybe, maybe people get that idea that here's God's man and I can't stay awake to hear him for a half hour. Uh, but God is not boring. God is wonderful. He is wonderful. Uh, and to be in our Lord's presence, uh, Psalm 16 says, um, is fullness of joy. It's pleasures forevermore. If you think that heaven will be boring, in effect, you're saying that God is boring and nothing could be further from the truth. The God we might accuse of being boring is the same God who gave us all the receptors in this body to receive pleasure. Do you know that? He, again, he created us. He's the one who gave us taste and tacos. He's the one that gave us touch and kittens to pet. He's the one that gave us smell and fresh bread break, baking that we can smell. He's the one that gave us warmth and coolness and sights and sounds and a massive network of sensory nerves in our body. He gave us sight and hearing and all these senses so that we can experience the things that he has for us. Can it be that we're so arrogant that we believe that we created pleasure? No, it's God who created pleasure. It's God who, who uh, wants to please his family. Uh, God is the source of every good and every pure thing that we enjoy. Uh, you are creative if you are creative, and you know, I, we have uh, uh, a couple of sons that are very creative. They're very artistic. I have uh, brothers and sisters who are very artistic and creative. Um, if I drew a cat, you wouldn't know that it was a cat. Uh, I don't have those kind of things, and yet uh, God has given me other gifts. God has given us these talents and gifts. We are creative because God is creative. We are we are made in his what? Image. In his image. He wants us to be chips off the block. He wants us to be like him. He wants us to, uh, scripture says he wants us to imitate him as dear what? Children. children. He wants us to imitate him as dear children. And, uh, and you, you know, I tried to get my, uh, my sons to be uh, engineers and none of them wanted to be an engineer. They wanted to be exactly not an engineer. <laughs> And, uh, you know, dad was an engineer. No, that's not for them. Uh, I don't know what the deal was, but that wasn't for them. Um, the real question is, um, how could God not be bored with us? <laughs> how could God not be bored with me and say, Jim, I just can't understand. I, I don't think I can spend eternity with you, Jim. You're too boring. And uh, he'd be right, but uh, we'll get to that a little bit later, too. So, Heaven will not be boring because God is not boring. Number two, you ready? Heaven will not be boring because you and your friends will not be boring. <laughs> uh, is, you know, in, in some cases we might think, well, I'm going to be a, you know, people who are not Christians would say, I don't want to be around a bunch of boring Christians. I don't want to be, uh, you know, around those Bible thumpers and, and that kind of thing. And uh, so I want, to, I want to show you that you and your friends will not be boring in heaven. Let's turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 15. 
1 Corinthians chapter 15. Okay, and let's uh, have somebody read verses 51 and 52, please. Listen, I tell you a mystery. We will not all sleep, but we will all be changed in a flesh, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet. For the trumpet will sound, the dead will be raised imperishable, and we will be changed. Amen. Twice we're told here that we will be changed. We shall all be changed, verse 51. We shall be changed in verse 52. And this will be a radical change. You will not be exactly like you are here. We will know that it's you. You will still have your personality and, and you will be you. But there is going to be a radical change to us. Uh, thank the Lord uh, before we get to heaven. Now, you know that verse 51 is... Uh, is I have heard a lot of preachers use this as a joke at, at the first of their sermons, that uh, the nursery in the churches uh, will have this posted. Uh, Behold, I tell you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. Talking about the babies in the nursery. <laughs> uh, let's turn to Philippians chapter 3. Philippians 3. Are we there? Getting there? Philippians 3, and let's have somebody read verses 20 and 21. For our conversation is in heaven, from whence also we look for the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who shall change our vile body, that it may be fashioned like unto his glorious body, according to the working, whereby he is able even to subdue all things unto himself. Amen. So verse 21 tells us, that the Lord is going to transform our lowly body to be like his glorious body. His lowly body to be like his glorious body. I like the word his translation used, our vile body. Our vile body, yeah, our, our corrupted body, our, our uh, you know, this body of sin. He is going to, uh, everything is going to be made new. Uh, whatever it is that makes you so awfully boring will be made new and perfect in Christ. Whatever makes you so awfully boring, Marsha, will be made new. And uh, and he's going to have... I don't want to do so much with the company I have. <laughs> he, he, yeah, well, that, that's the point. He's going to have to work harder on some of us than others. And uh, some of you are sitting next to your spouse um, right now thinking, praise the Lord. He's, he is not going to be boring in heaven. <laughs> and here's the other thing in that same point your Christian friends will not be boring either do you have any boring Christian friends now you, you want you love them right you love them but they're not the best company sometimes that, that can be me a lot of the times Hebrews 12 let's turn to Hebrews 12 we're getting a uh, scriptural workout tonight turning the pages of God's word, and that's a good thing. Hebrews 12. Okay, let's have somebody read verses 22 and 23, please. But you have come to Mount Zion, to the heavenly Jerusalem, the city of the living God. You have come to thousands upon thousands of the angels in joyful assembly, to the church of the firstborn, whose names are written in heaven, you have come to God, the judge of all men, to the spirits of righteous men made perfect. All right, you are coming into something pretty special. We are on our way there. I, I like, uh, uh, we're marching to Zion. Beautiful, beautiful Zion, we're marching upward to Zion, the beautiful city of God. And it's not just a beautiful city. Uh, what a guest list. Uh, we get to have fellowship with Moses, with Hannah, 
with Elijah, with Isaiah, with Mary, bunches of Marys, <laughs> with David, in fact, apparently, millions of Davids. <laughs> no? And, well, and I'm just thinking of the innumerable martyrs. Yes. That we don't even know about. Yeah. Nope. And how fascinating it's going to be to talk to them and, and their great faith that, that uh, what yeah, what a privilege. Uh, and uh, Paul and John, the disciple whom Jesus loved, and Ruth, and more and more and more. It's going to be fantastic. And just as we have been changed, so they all also have been changed. Uh, when we get there, your friends will not be boring, and we will be one supercharged, wonderful, Christ-like gathering forever, forever. You are going to want to be in the presence of of everyone there in heaven. Um, since hundreds of generations can't live on the earth simultaneously, think of this. You'll possibly find that in eternity you'll become fast friends with Noah, with Daniel, with Sarah, or even your great, 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 great grandma. You might be, you might find out uh, you never even knew her name, but in heaven, if she's there, You'll know, you'll know her, and, and you may become very close to your own relatives that you've never even heard of. I can't wait to ask Moses this. Did he ever dream that Charlton Heston would make him so famous? Uh, and of course, our Proverbs 18.24 uh, says this. A friend that sticks closer than what? A brother. You know, we have our friends there, but there is a friend that sticks closer than a brother, and that's our Lord, our Lord, our God. I don't think you could be bored in heaven even if you tried. Even if you tried. Uh, remember, heaven is a place where there is absolutely, positively no sin. <laughs> That means that you can take every word that all of us say at face value, exactly what it means. Um, you will not have to walk away from a conversation thinking, now what did she mean by that? <laughs> you won't have to do that because everything's going to be sincere. Heaven won't be boring because you and your friends will not be boring. That may be something you never thought of. Yes. Heaven is going to be joyful. Yes. Boring is not joyful. No. Therefore, there can't be more. Right, right. Have, let me, let's just play this for a minute. Let's take, take a break and let's just play this. Um, I want you to finish this question. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to ask you, don't everybody shout at one time. Just raise your hand when you get a thought here. Um, finish this question. Heaven won't be boring because... You're with Jesus. You're with Jesus Christ. Amen. And now you raised your hand. Yes. No darkness. No what? No darkness. No darkness. It's <laughs> the brightness of the Lord. Amen. Heaven won't be boring because? Yes. We'll be leaping from a stall like a cat. <laughs> yeah. That's Malachi 4. Malachi 4. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> we, won't, we won't be boring in heaven because? How about this side of the room? This side's sharp. You said there's so many people to talk to. So many people to talk to, yeah. We have, we have so many, millions, I hope, that, that are in heaven that, that we'll get to know and talk to and, and get to be close with. Yes? The music. The music, yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Songs. Yeah, there won't be any sour notes in heaven. No. <laughs> and every pianist will be, be uh, just a, an amazing pianist and... And uh, the harp players, you know, we don't have harp players around very much these days, but in the old days, there were harp players, man, including David. And, and so we'll get to hear that possibly. Uh, so heaven won't be boring because you and your friends won't be boring. Here's the third one that I've got. And I just did that to, to prove this. There's plenty of reasons why heaven won't be boring. Again, I'm not doing an exhaustive study here. I'm hoping to bring things to your mind that's going to cause you to want to study a little harder. Number three, heaven won't be boring because your work there will not be boring. Heaven won't be boring because your work... Wait a minute, Jim. You're saying we have to work in heaven? 
So for some of us, that rubs us the wrong way, doesn't it? Listen, being in heaven forever with a perfectly glorified body, a body like the glorified Jesus, and a mind that is sharp now, a mind that, that doesn't have Alzheimer's, a mind like mine that's not forgetful, a mind that is, that is uh, uh, intelligent, uh, you are going to be bored and it will be torture if all you do is sit around. Do you think the Lord's just going to have us sit around? No. Heaven is a place where we find rest from our earthly labors, but the Bible mentions the thought of us serving, working in heaven, though we tend to read right over it because that's something we really don't want to absorb or understand. When, created, when God created everything, he placed Adam in a heavenly paradise called what? Eden, the Garden of Eden, and, uh, and he gave Adam a job. God gave Adam a job. Turn to Genesis chapter 2. That's, uh, what book of the Bible is that? That's the, that's the first. Old Testament. Yeah, Old Testament. Genesis 2, let's have somebody read verse 15, please. Then the Lord God took the man and put him in the Garden of Eden to tend and keep it. Yeah. Now, you say, well, wait a minute, that's not, that's not heaven. No, but what was, God's, what was God's creation before sin entered the world? God made a paradise. God made a paradise and, uh, and he put sinless Adam and sinless Eve in this paradise, set them in the garden, and he set Adam there so that Ad Adam could work it, tend it, and keep it. And, and he gave him a job. And, and I'm telling you that because God is going to do the same thing for us. And, uh, and it doesn't say that when, when Adam was given the job, Adam said, Oh, come on. The garden? I don't like gardening. He didn't say that. He took the job. And, uh, and uh, uh, the parable of talents in Matthew 25. Let's look at that. Matthew 25. Because here we have, a, a, uh, here we have an example of uh, the Lord Jesus giving us a parable that does talk about an, an eternal value. Uh, Matthew 25. And I'll read uh, here. I'm going to read verses 20 and 21 in just a moment. Matthew 25, 20 and 21. Jesus said, And he who had received the five talents, now you know the story about the talents, right? That, uh, that Jesus uh, talked about uh, a man who was leaving, uh, a master who was leaving uh, for a while, and he gave his, uh, his servants um, talents, money, that they were to uh, manage until he returned. And so uh, it says in verse 20, and he who had received five talents came forward bringing five talents more, saying, Master, you delivered to me five talents. Here I have made five talents more. Listen to what his master says. His master said to him, well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful over a little. I will set you over much. Enter into the joy of your master. I want to read that last part again. I will set you over much. You've been faithful. That's, you know, here on earth, God has given us. I like that, it, that it's using the word talents. In some of your uh, versions, it may not say talents. It may use another word. But God has given us gifts and talents and abilities. He's given us gifts that we can use here on earth. Now, some of us are going to come at the end of, of, uh, uh, of our lives and we're going to stand before the Lord and we're going to say, you gave me the ability to teach, the ability to understand, uh, the ability to counsel or the ability to, to, uh, to help others with, uh, with financial problems. You've given me the ability to, to, uh, to, to have a heart for, for people in need and, and, uh, and you've Put me on that ministry and here's what i've done lord here's how here's what i've done with the gifts that you've given me and and we're going to hear the master say uh well done good and faithful servant you know what you were 
faithful over a little, and I will set you over much. Set you over much where? In the kingdom. In the kingdom. Enter into the joy of your master. We're going to get back to that sentence here in just a minute, but i got another example to show you. John chapter 5. John tells us that the Father himself is working in heaven. Let's uh, turn to John chapter 5. Sometimes we just think of God being uh, kicked back. I know that it says that the earth is his footstool, but uh, God isn't, isn't just kicked back all the time. God is working. Uh, let's have somebody read John chapter 5, verses 15 through 17, please. John 5, 15 to 17. The, the Father is working, and so is the Son. Uh, Jesus says, my Father is working. If the Father's working, do you think you're not going to work? you think you're not going to serve? Uh, the Lord is serving us, isn't he? Jesus came to this earth to serve, not to be served. And, uh, and when we go to heaven, we're going to be serving him. Uh, let's turn to Revelation chapter 7. Revelation 7. Let's have somebody read verse 15. Revelation 7, 15. Therefore they are before the throne of God and serve him day and night in his temple. And he who sits on the throne will dwell among them. Okay. Revelation 7, 15 shows us a glimpse into... into uh, the heavenly realm and it says and, and therefore they're before the throne serving him day and night and uh, and so we're going to be serving the Lord let's look at verse uh, at uh, Revelation 22 Revelation 22 last chapter in the Bible Let's have somebody read just verse 3 to begin with. Revelation 22, verse 3. No longer will there be any curse. The throne of God and of the Lamb will be in the city, and his servants will serve him. His servants will serve him. Um, listen, the, the, the message is clear that, that we are going to be serving the Lord. We're going to be serving the Lord. Let's have somebody read in that same chapter, verses 8 and 9. I, John, am the one who heard and saw these things. And when I heard and saw them, I fell down to worship at the feet of the angel who showed them to me. But he said to me, you must not do that. I am a fellow servant with you and your brothers and prophets with those who keep the words of this book worship God all right so this angel says hey I'm a fellow servant like you and your brothers like you and the family of God we're going to be servants of God uh, listen when we get to heaven we'll continue being servants of God we need to practice pretty hard here to be servants right we need to be so it shouldn't be any big change for us to walk from time into eternity and continue serving the Lord. Uh, and uh, so we're going to continue. Many of us uh, who call ourselves by his name need to get going on the servant part here on earth. There are many who, who uh, believe that, that they have made their way uh, to repentance and baptism, receiving the Holy Spirit, and now they just ride the, the pew and ride, ride the seats in the auditorium and they get you know, then they get to heaven, they got the rest of eternity just to rest, and that's not true. Servants work. They have responsibility. They perform tasks for their master, and our master is the Lord. And that servant-master relationship will not change when we make it into eternity. 
he will still be the master, we will still be the servants. Uh, many of us uh, say that we can't wait to hear the Lord say, well done, good and faithful servant. We shouldn't expect the Lord to say this though, well done, good and faithful servant. Take the rest of eternity off. <laughs> he's, he's not going to say that. He's not going to say that. Notice that this servant-master relationship won't be boring. The parable in Matthew 25 says, Well done, good and faithful servant. Listen now. You have been faithful over a little. I will set you over much. Enter into the what? The joy of your master. Enter into the joy of your master. Jesus says that to be his servant, you're going to enter into this, this uh, kingdom of joy because you're his servant. And uh, we are going to be joyful to be his servant. Uh, now, do I have a, a job listing? Like uh, at the unemployment office, the card file, you flip through and see, I need somebody to, to polish the golden streets. I don't know what he's got for us. I don't know that, but we're going to be his servants and we're going to be joyful to do it. It's going to be a pleasure for us to serve the Lord. Uh, let me ask you this, just to, to prove the point. Have you ever in your life started a project and you really wanted to accomplish it, but you didn't have the time or the money or the resources to finish it, and it, it was left undone. It was left half done. Have you ever had that? I've done that more than once, right? <laughs> I've done that more than once. Have you ever wanted to start something or build something or design something, a great idea that you've had? But your earthly schedule or your financial situation or your ability just didn't allow it to happen. I, again, I have to raise my hand. Marsha's going to tell you that, uh, that I'm the man of million dollar ideas. Yeah. Yep. <laughs> I come up with, with what I call my million dollar ideas a lot. How many times have I cashed in on them, Marsha? Zero. A big zero. <laughs> I've never had the time or the, the uh, money to implement them or carry them out. Uh, probably 20 years ago, uh, I remember explaining to Marsha this, honestly, about 20 years ago at least, I said, you know what would be a really good business for us to start? Uh, we, we make deals with restaurants in the area and, and people wouldn't have to go out of their house like on a rainy day or with a, they get home from work and they're tired. They could call the restaurant, order food. We'd go pick it up and deliver it to them. They'd pay us a small fee. That's a million dollar idea today, right? Grubhub and, and uh, Uber Eats and, and all these things. Uh, DoorDash. An idea in 2005, though, was one of my best. You'll like this one. A hot dog. <laughs> a hot dog shaped like a hockey puck. And, and I would call it puck dog. Puck dog. Uh, they'd be really popular at hockey games. But anyway, puck dog. Then you could put them in a hamburger bun, and, and we could just rid the world of hot dog buns. I get tired of hot dog buns anyway, they fall apart. You could get rid of hot dog buns and just put it in a hamburger bun. And my wife says, Jim, you're talking about bologna. <laughs> <laughs> They've already invented that. But uh, I still think it's a million dollar idea. It's all in, in how you merchandise it, how you sell it. Uh, in eternity, listen, time will not be a factor anymore. Finances won't be a factor anymore. Your creative side will have all the time you need to express yourself, to glorify the Lord in, in your creativity and to finish projects because you've got eternity to, to glorify the master with your creative side. God wants us to be creative. He's creative and he's put that in us. And, uh, and so whatever you create or make is also going to last how long? How long is it going to last? Forever. Forever. There's a lot of things I've done that I have achieved that didn't last forever, that's for sure. Um, and uh, so we won't have to deal with that. Here's the fourth and final one. Heaven will not be boring because heaven is the place you've always longed for. Heaven is the place you've always wanted to be, uh, whether you know it or not. Romans chapter 8, please. Romans 8.
And let's have somebody read verses 22 and 23, please. Romans 8, 22, 23. Thank you. Um, creation has been groaning until now. Uh, we ourselves, we groan inwardly as we wait eagerly our adoption, our redemption, our, our being ushered in, whooshed into the family and, and uh, in the presence of the Lord Jesus Christ. We wait for that. We crave for that. We yearn and we groan for that. God has put a hunger in the heart of and soul of a Christian to desire and to see eternal results that mean redemption in Christ, being in his presence, being in this place. Jesus, Jesus wouldn't have told us in John chapter 14, um, uh, you know, uh, you believe in God, believe also in me. In my father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare what? A place for you. He wouldn't have told us those things if if he didn't want us to know that, if he didn't want us to hunger and yearn for that. Uh, a home in the Father's house, a wonderful uh, picture of warmth and love and the Father welcoming us home. Uh, that's going to be great. Um, let's turn to Ecclesiastes chapter 3. Ecclesiastes chapter 3. Solomon tells us a little bit about this, Ecclesiastes 3, and then after, after we read this verse, we're going to read, just hang on to Ecclesiastes. Ecclesiastes 3, 11, if somebody would read just that one verse. He has made everything beautiful in its time. He has also set eternity in the hearts of men, yet they cannot fathom what God has done from beginning to end. Thank you. He has put eternity into man's heart. God has put eternity into our hearts. He's made everything beautiful in its time, and he's put eternity into our hearts. God has put the desire in us that can only be satisfied with eternity in the Lord's fellowship. Earthly attempts at filling that desire fall far, far short, as Solomon said in Ecclesiastes. Turn to chapter 2, Ecclesiastes. And I'm going to read for you verses 9 through 11. Chapter 2, Solomon says, So I became great and surpassed all who were before me in Jerusalem. Also my wisdom remained with me, and whatever my eye desired, I did not keep uh, from them. Everything he desired, he got hold of. Um, and it says, I kept my heart from no pleasure, for my heart found pleasure in all my toil. And this was my reward for my toil. Then I considered all that my hands had done and the toil that I had exp expended in doing it. And behold, all was vanity and striving after the wind, and there was nothing to be gained under the sun. Solomon says, I didn't hold back anything. If I wanted something, I got it. If I saw something I liked, I took it. If, if, uh, if there was a pleasure out there that I thought would satisfy me, I did it. And he sure did, didn't he? he? He was richest man in the world. He was the man with the most wisdom. He had, uh, I think, 700 wives, 300 concubines. Yikes. Uh, and he, and he, he tried to satisfy that longing that God has put in our hearts with earthly things. And he, at the end of the day, he says, it's all vanity. It's empty. It's vacuum. It, it's loneliness. It's, it doesn't fill the need that I have. And uh, the things that we believe will bring us pleasure and satisfaction and fulfillment in this world aren't as great as they seem once we get them. Were you going to say something? They didn't have psychiatrists back then, did they? No. Well, seven hundred wives. Yeah. Hey, right. <laughs> right. Uh, if you think about it, 
people are doing that same thing today. Yeah. I mean, they're miserable, lonely, and unhappy, yeah. and they will try anything and do anything to try to fix that. Right, exactly right. We find ourselves thinking sometimes, um, have you ever wanted that car or wanted that house? Or, or uh, like me, I like ink pens and watches. Ink pens and watches. Now I'm wearing a $40 watch. I'm not wearing a $300 watch or, or a $1,000 watch or a Gucci or whatever there is out there. I'm, I'm not doing that, but I have seen some beautiful pens that are like thousands of dollars. I don't know why I like ink pens. Uh, I just think, man, if I sign my name with that, whoo, that's going to be sharp. And, and the watches, the Rolexes and things like that, oh my goodness, uh, they're, they're dandy. Uh, but have you ever found yourself thinking once you get something that you've wanted for so long, you think, is that, is that all there is? Is that it? If you get that promotion at work you've been striving for for so long, man, so this is it. This, I just got more work to do is all I got. You know, yeah, I got a little bit more money, but man, it's stressful here at the top. Um, and, and if something is somewhat satisfying and pleasurable, there comes a time when it's snatched away too here on earth. Uh, every pleasure we have here is going to be gone. It's temporary. It's, it's vanity of vanities, like Solomon said. All is vanity. All is temporary. All is empty without the Lord. You may think that there's something wrong with you. Why can't I enjoy this promotion? Why can't I enjoy this new house or new car? No, you're perfectly normal. God is showing you that you can never be fulfilled or satisfied here on earth. Your hunger is a hunger for the eternal. It's for eternity with this Father who's made a, a place for you in his home. That's where uh, our, our desires are, the emptiness in us uh, for things in this world actually is healthy for us. Uh, there's a place in us that itches that we can't scratch. Uh, God has put us in us a desire for heaven and eternity with his son. Uh, the reason you won't be bored in heaven is that heaven and eternity with Jesus Christ is everything you've been looking for, whether you know it or not. It's everything you've been looking for. No more itch. No more emptiness, no more vanity of vanities, uh, no more hollowness of life. Uh, so let's review. Here we are at about the end of the hour. Let's review. Heaven will not be boring because God is not boring. Heaven will not be boring because you and your friends will not be boring. Heaven will not be boring because your work will not be boring. And heaven will not be boring because heaven is the place you've always longed to be. Do you know what boring is, though? Being in solitary confinement, being in total darkness, being separated from all of your friends and family, being separated from God and the Lord Jesus Christ, being separated in eternal torment, knowing that the saved loved ones that you have are in a place you'll never experience, having your regrets as your meditation forever. That's boring. That is eternity. Uh, and we're going to explore the pits of hell. Uh, we'll put on our miners caps and we'll go down and we will explore that at another time. Uh, but I just wanted to make that contrast. If you think heaven, heaven is great, but hell's not all that bad, you are drastically wrong. Drastically wrong. Um, I've read another epitaph. We do have time. I can give you the second one as we close. Um, on a tombstone, actually somewhere here in Indiana, I looked for it. Several, several preachers have mentioned this epitaph in their sermons, and I cannot find it anywhere, a picture of the gravestone or whatever. But supposedly in Indiana somewhere, there's a tombstone that says this. Pause, stranger, when you pass me by, as you are now, so once was I. As I am now, so you will be. Prepare yourself to follow me. And someone scratched <laughs> below it. To follow you, I'm not content until I know which way you went. <laughs> <laughs> now the man is at the bottom of this pit. 
<laughs> big, big man. <laughs> Fear not. There's still time for you to choose the path of righteousness that leads to this kingdom, this heaven that's been created for those who love the Lord. You can do it right now, tonight. And I know I'm talking to people who love the Lord. Um, I know I'm talking to people online who, who uh, profess to love the Lord. I also know that, that this is going to be viewed uh, potentially by a whole lot of people uh, on YouTube uh, who I don't know personally. And, uh, and if you are not right with the Lord, uh, let me tell you that Acts 2.38 commands us this, that once we have faith, uh, Ephesians chapter 2, uh, verse 8 says that we are saved by grace through faith. It's our faith in the Lord uh, and not of works. We cannot be saved by works. Uh, we are saved by the grace of God is, is a gift to us. Acts 2.38 tells us to repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. It's just that simple. Be saved. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, in Jesus' name, we come to you at the end of our hour. And we thank you, Lord, for this place called heaven, this home that you've prepared for us, this eternity that we get to spend in your presence, dear Lord. And our hearts do hunger for it. This world becomes very hard to live in sometimes. It can be dangerous. It can be ugly. It can be profane and so sinful. And we know that we don't belong here, that we're just passing through this world on our way to you. Help us get there. Lead us with a strong voice from your word and your spirit. Help us to be one as a church, one in each other and one in you. And Lord, uh, we pray that those who are watching, those who have participated with us in this study, uh, who are not saved, would find their salvation, their hope, their redemption in Jesus Christ, even now. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 God bless you all. Have a wonderful evening. I have a question. Yes. Okay, so we're in heaven, and we were witnessing to people here on earth yes. before the call. Will we have a, a sadness in our heart because Joe Blow did not come to to Christ. I gave him his chance. I was witnessing to him. What will happen? That Will I feel that sadness in my heart because no. I didn't speak to him enough? No. On, on the earth, uh, yes. In heaven, no. I mean, there's, the, as far as I understand, unless somebody knows something, that's a passage that I'm not aware of, there's, there's no sadness in heaven. No he will wipe every tear from our eyes. We, we, uh, we will be in a place where it'll be joy, and, uh, and praise God for that. We don't need those kind of uh, things. The Lord is giving opportunities to every man, woman, and child to come to him. And, uh, and uh, so uh, once we get there, uh, that's not going to be a weight on us. Yeah, yeah. God, God will block all the things such as that. And anybody you knew here, you will know if they went to hell or not. Because say, Joe Blow, he's good friends with, he didn't make it. You will know that he went down there. Because that would bring sadness. Uh, Don, I don't know if you heard uh, Lois's question, but uh, she was asking, will we feel <laughs> sadness um, when, when we get to heaven and we find out that someone we've witnessed to for so long uh, did not accept Christ as our Savior. Uh, do you have any comment on that? Yeah, no, that, that will not be the case. Uh, uh, there's no sadness in heaven. So uh, said it, uh, God said he's going to wipe, wipe away all of our tears. And uh, so that means there's just going to be joy. So Amen. Uh, there won't be sadness. Amen. Thank you. I, I think to add to that, though, uh, we're committed this side of heaven to witness at any opportunity that we can. And we all know those cases, as you mentioned earlier, mm -hmm. studies. We have that little millisecond yes. of either saying something or not. Yes. And, and 
So we need to be urged to, to do that yeah. and to understand that um, that person's decision is their decision. Mm -hmm. we, we want them to go to heaven. Oh, we do, and we, and we pray for that. But it may, be, it may well be someone else that uh, converts that individual. Yeah. Due to your prayers and your witnessing and what have you in the past, Tammy had a, she had a wonderful thing happen just this week. A guy who, shall I say, 40 years ago, would hear me. She, she was a Christian girl in a Christian home, modest dress, and this guy gave her all kinds of problems mm. you know, as she was on the bus with her uh, brother. Uh -huh. And so um, we haven't read the book yet, but he's written a book, and he's mentioned her, her family. <laughs> How about that? And so we, we, I mean, it's just 40 years. So see, it doesn't happen overnight either. Yeah. So uh, standing up will really be right. Ultimately, it, it was his name was Mark. Mm -hmm. uh, he went to prison, and, you know, from the lowest of the low to a Christian man now. Yeah, who's all about converting people to Christ. Yeah, and you're right. We we may not be the one that actually holds their hand and walks them in, but but uh, I think Paul was the one that said, uh, "I watered, and Apollos did this," and you know, we we all have a part in. And that's been the case in my life. There's been people who have witnessed to me all through my life, and and it was Marsha who said, uh, "Come, come and hear, hear, come and worship with me, come to church with me," and uh, that's that's where I heard the word and was saved. Yeah. I could hear Don. What did he say? No sadness. Yeah, he basically said what we said. Same thing that God's going to wipe away our tears and and uh, there's no sadness in heaven. Yeah. There's All right. There's a scripture that says we will know as we are known. Yes. So I'm not sure where that's at, but uh -huh. don't you think we'll? I mean, we we will know so much that I don't think that it's going to be an issue. No. And uh, and I think that's talking. Um, I think it's talking specifically about we will know him as he knows us. Yeah. That right now we we look through a, as a, as in a dim mirror. Yeah. Um, but, pardon me. King James says a glass darkly. A glass darkly, yeah. But in but then we will see and as we are seen. So, yeah. All right. Well, listen. God bless you. Have a wonderful night. And uh, thanks for coming. Good to see you all. Okay, well, thanks, Jim. All right. Uh, good, John, good take lesson. care. John, we'll okay. see you. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> God bless.